Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Mishawaka, Indiana. This morning is actually Global Hymn Sing Sunday. The first song that we'll be singing this morning will be sung by almost one million believers around the world this morning. And that song is Jesus Shall Reign. Actually, if we go back one side, you can see a map. And all the dark spots are all the churches that are committed to singing this song this morning together with us. And so we're joining in with a global hymn sing. I invite you to stand, please, as we sing together. Jesus shall reign where the sun. gospel. And Lord, we'll be motivated and desirous to glorify you by proclaiming the gospel to the world around us. 
And Lord, I pray that you will be exalted and glorified through everything that we do. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and take a few moments to greet each other this morning. for 2017 and uh, so what we ask is that you take one per family and uh, go through those and look it over and then on uh, March 11th we will be voting as a church to uh, accept the annual report and so I encourage you to look through that be prior to that if you have any questions about it either ask myself or pastor Nate would be glad to uh, answer your questions I do want to encourage you to be back this evening. Um, our Awana will be, begin uh, tonight at 5.30 as uh, well as our student ministries. Uh, the young people are going through a study of uh, walking the same way you talk. In other words, living the way God wants you to live. And so I encourage the young people to be here for that. Uh, also, the adults will begin here at 6 o'clock. The adults are going through a study of the Holy Spirit. Specifically, tonight we'll be talking about the deity of the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you to be out with us tonight. I also want you to note on your calendars in April, April 22nd through the 26th, uh, will be the Frazier Gospel Conference. Uh, Jeremy Frazier and his team will be here for that week. Uh, we'll have more information as we get closer, but mark that in your calendar as uh, setting aside those days to try to be here as many nights as you can uh, to be blessed from the Word of God. I'm going to ask our men to come forward for our morning uh, worship offering, and as they're coming, let's pray. God, we thank you that we can be here this morning and we can worship you. And uh, Lord, as we worship you now through our gifts, uh, Lord, I pray, pray that you are um, glorified. Uh, Lord, it's not about us giving to you because um, we are uh, something special. It's because we are thankful and grateful for all that you have done for us. And so, Lord, I pray you help us to give out of gratitude. And we ask this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Please join me in standing together. by singing together of the mystery of the gospel as it was revealed in the scriptures as we sing together. Come behold the wondrous mystery. transgression of Adam, 
was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to continue to learn a song that we began last week, His Mercy is More.
a few moments now to pray. God, your word says in the Old Testament that as far as the east is from the west, so far have our sins been removed from us. And in the New Testament, you say that where sin has abounded, grace did that much more abound on our behalf. You have over and over again reassured us of the mighty power of your grace toward us. And you treat us not as our sins deserve, but as Christ deserves through faith in him. And for that, we are grateful this morning. We're thankful that we sit here, not condemned to die in eternal death, but justified to live freely to serve you. And that's an awesome privilege. And that's why we, we pray and we sing that your name would reign over all the land, over all peoples and tongues and nations that you would be lifted up, that people would see the sun and be saved, even as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, that they would look on Christ and confess their sins and place their faith in him. And we pray, Father, that this year you would use our church, help us as we lift up your son in the wilderness of this world, even in this neighborhood, in Mishawaka and South Bend, that we would lift up the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that people would look on him and be saved. I pray, Father, this morning as your word comes to us through your servant, our pastor, help us, help us to hear, but then also help us to be changed. May your spirit move upon us. We recognize that if it's just up to us, nothing will change. We need your spirit to work together with our will and to change us. We pray that you be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. If you're able, would you please join us in standing once more as we sing together 10,000 Reasons.
children who are normally in junior church will remain in the service this morning. Excellent singing. I hope that is your desire is to worship um, God and all of the attributes about Him. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 will be our text for this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week was our Vision Sunday. Um, and uh, I do not normally say this, but I highly recommend... That if you weren't here last week, that you go onto our website and uh, find the message and listen to it. That's not a self-promotion. Um, that is a statement because the message last week is setting the tone for the entire year. What is it we are, um, our goal is as a church, what are we striving for? And uh, if you are a regular attender, if you're a member and you were not able to be here, you're not able to listen to it. Um, I, I challenge you to do that. You can go on our website and uh, uh, take the time to listen to that. We talked about last week about the importance of being individuals in a church that are serious about sharing the gospel. And so I felt that it was important, it was necessary for me to take a little time over the next few weeks and, and preach uh, a series on the topic of what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is exactly, what is it we're talking about? Now, in simple definition, the word gospel means good news. Um, it is uh, the idea of receiving good news. Um, how many of you have ever received really good news before? Anyone? Hopefully most of you have. You received really good news. Um, I, was, uh, I was thinking about this this week, and I was trying to think of good news that impacted more than just me. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you good news that I received that impacts every single person in this room. And you'll see why. About three years ago as a church, we um, were, well actually it was longer than that ago, but we began the process of um, updating this auditorium. And, and in that, about three years ago, we decided we needed new, it would be good to have new seats. The seats we had were getting old, um, and uh, we decided to um, update. We began looking around and we found that these seats that you're sitting on here uh, were going to cost us about $80,000. So as a church, we, we began uh, saving money, we began, uh, you as people began giving, and uh, over the course of about six, seven months, we had raised uh, about $25,000, which is it's quite a bit. But considering we needed to raise eighty, dollars we were kind of thinking, uh-oh, we have a long way to go. And I remember one day thinking in my mind, it's going to take about five years to raise this money. And then one day I went into the church office. And uh, some of you don't know this, but in the church office, there's a series of mailboxes for each people that are on staff or who have leadership positions here. And um, when I go in there, in my church, my box, typically, now, now my secretaries um, know throughout uh, the time I've been here that if it's junk mail, throw it away. I don't want to see junk mail. But if they're not sure, they'll stick it in my box. But most of the time, when I go to my box, I pull it out, and usually it's still junk mail. Um, and so I open it up, maybe look at it for a few moments and throw it away. Well, this one particular day I walked in the office and I reached in and there was a, there was a letter there addressed to me. So I thought, okay, that's unusual. I don't usually see that type of thing here. And, and it was handwritten in a little, uh, little envelope. And so I opened it up and um, there was a check. And as you know, you're supposed to do, I decided to read the letter before I looked at the check. I know we don't usually do that, but I decided to do that. So I began reading this letter, and it was from a person that I had interacted with, that I had ministered to, and uh, uh, had been a part of this church at some point. And, and uh, they were just thanking me and thanking the church for uh, just different things and said, I just wanted to give a gift to help the church out. And I turned the check over, and it was a check for $75,000. I was like... I remember I was standing and I turned around and I sat down in the chair and went, oh, <laughs> never seen money like that. It was good news. Now, what I did next was I called the individual and I said, did you mean to do this? Or was this an accident? And he said, no, I meant to. 
we were able to apply that to the rest of the chairs. That's why I said this is good news that impacts every one of you, because you're all sitting on them. And then we were able to use the rest of the money that didn't go towards those seats to help start the process of our bathrooms that we updated uh, a couple of years ago as well. Good news is something we all love to hear. And as we talk about the, what is the gospel, um, we're going to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Now for some, this type of series may seem unusual or even unnecessary for those of us who are believers and have heard the gospel before. Maybe it's something you think, I get this, I understand this. However, I not only believe it is necessary to have a type of message like this and a series like this, but I am convinced that it's imperative for our modern church. I fear that many believe the truth of the gospel and have even responded in faith unto salvation but they fail to realize the significance and the relevance of the gospel in our everyday life. I think the gospel impacts not just your salvation, but it should impact every moment of your day. Um, some of you maybe have heard of him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a preacher in Germany during World War II, and he opposed uh, the Nazis and what they taught, and because of that, he lost his life. He wrote a book um, called The Cost of Discipleship, and in it he talked about how, disciple, how, how the gospel, or, or specifically how grace uh, is, grace is, is the idea of something we don't deserve, but yet grace is very costly. And he said this, you can read it there, costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. The gift which must be asked for. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it follow, causes us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his Son. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his Son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. And really what we're talking about is that costly grace is the essence of the gospel. That Jesus Christ came and died for you. And that is incredibly good news. A proper understanding and devotion to the gospel is a must if you're going to have a victorious Christian life. It's not just a must for salvation, but it's a must for every aspect of your life. Let's look in this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm just going to read uh, two verses. That's it, starting in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with with the scriptures. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this passage. Very clear, very concise, but incredibly powerful. So Lord, I pray that you'll help us to understand this passage again, as if we are hearing it for the first time. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to allow it to change us. Lord, work through my life and work through my words as I speak. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin this series, I want to examine the truths within this text, and I want to answer the question, what is the gospel? We must understand its foundation if we are going to allow it to transform and conform us into his image. We must know it's as important if we're going to allow it to change every aspect of our lives. Because it's not just about our salvation, but a proper understanding of the gospel will change the way you think. It'll change the way you parent. It'll change the way that you uh, view church attendance. It'll change the way uh, that you view everything in life. Proper understanding of the gospel will radically change your life. So we want to look at that. There's a few aspects of the gospel. First of all, I want you to look at the foundational truth of the gospel. In, in our text, Paul reveals the very foundation of the gospel. This is a very simple verse, a very simple passage. In fact, um, I've had two kids that have gone through Awana, and I, I don't remember what, some of you maybe that have worked in Awana for years. There's one particular, I think it's Sparks, 
that they work on this passage in particular. And so many of our kids have learned this passage. It's so elementary in its, in its understanding, but yet so deep. Because Paul is laying a foundation. He's laying a basis. Uh, and he beautifully sums up the gospel in this passage. And while it's not complicated, we must understand each element involved to properly receive and respond and live according to the gospel. So what are some aspects in your notes? You see a few here. First of all, the identification of the Savior. Look at verse 3 again. It says in that passage, uh, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. We're actually going to talk about that more at the end. But he says this, that Christ. The first aspect is we must understand Christ. Now we look at that and we think, okay, I get that, Christ. What are you talking about there? Well, specifically what Paul is doing right there is he is, he is talking about Jesus Christ, but by calling him Christ... He is immediately saying something to us that maybe you hear, maybe you don't. What he is saying is, is that Jesus Christ is God. He is the Son of God. That term Christ is the indication that it's not just a mere man, Jesus, but he's Christ. He is the Lord. He is the Son of the living God. He is the central figure throughout all of time and humanity. His life upon earth cannot be disputed. We know that Jesus Christ came. Biblical records show us that, but not only that, historical records show us that Jesus came and that he lived on this earth and that he died on this earth. But for the gospel to have any significance, you must believe that Jesus Christ was more than just a man. You know, there are many religions, there are many people who believe that Jesus Christ came and that he was a good man. He is more than just a man. And if you are going to believe the gospel, you must understand that. We must see him as more than just a great teacher, more than just a prophet, more than just a miracle worker. You must agree and believe by faith that Jesus was and is the Son of God. And there are, there are numerous texts in Scripture that we can look at. If you reject the truth that Jesus was the Son of God, then you have denied the foundational truth of the gospel, and you will be unable to receive salvation. So we have to start with that word, that Christ, that He is God. What John tells us in John chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word. That, that Word is talking about Jesus Christ. In the beginning was Jesus. And the Word, Jesus, was with God. And then look what it says. And the Word, Jesus, was God. So you cannot understand the Gospel until you understand that truth. It goes on in verse 14, and John says, And the Word, Jesus, became flesh. This, this God became flesh. So He was fully God, but yet He became flesh. And He lived among us. That's the term Emmanuel, God with us. And, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He is God. For the Gospel to have significance, you must believe that fact. And so when we talk about the Gospel, it starts with the identification of the Savior, that He isn't just a man, He is God. But then secondly, it leads to the crucifixion of the Savior. Look at verse 3 again. It says that Christ did what? He died. Once you've accepted the fact that, that Jesus was the Son of God, come to earth as man, you are ready to embrace the second truth, and is that is that Jesus died on a cross. As we study the Bible, and even if you study history, you'll see that following the ministry of about three and a half years where Jesus uh, walked in the earth and, and preached and taught and, and interacted in ministry, never once doing wrong, he was betrayed by one of his own, Judas. The Bible tells us that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver and betrayed. He was arrested. He was condemned to death. See, who was this man? This man, Jesus, lived a sinless life. He never once sinned. He never once disobeyed his heavenly father. He never once disobeyed his parents. He never once had a need to repent. He never once had to stop and say, I was wrong. Never once did he do that. Yet he was condemned. Why? Because of hateful, sinful men. And they denied that, that Jesus was in fact the Christ. They just denied that Jesus was in fact God. And so they accused him of blasphemy because he claimed that he was the Son of God. And so since he claimed that, they said, you are blasphemous. 
And blasphemy was punishable by death. So since these men believed that Jesus was blasphemer, they called for his immediate death on the cross. And Jesus was crucified. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 23, and when they came to the place that is called the skull or Golgotha, there they crucified him. We know that story, but Jesus hung on the cross and what Paul is telling us in this passage is, here's what you need to know, that Christ died. You cannot embrace the gospel apart from the death of Christ on the cross. And that is what we're being told here, that this is the pivotal message of the Bible. And then the third thing we notice is the substitution of the Savior. Look again at verse 3. And this is huge. So look at this. What does it say in the middle of verse 3? That Christ died. Why? For our sins. Do you, you take the magnitude of that? Following your acceptance that Christ, of Christ's death on the cross, you must embrace the reason why he died. See, many will agree that Christ died. And you talk to people who don't believe in God and don't believe in the Bible, and they'll say, yeah, we know Jesus Christ died or Jesus died, but they won't accept why he died. They refuse to believe that. But Jesus, who was God in the flesh, he was eternal God-man, he was holy God, holy man, he lived with a life without any sin, and Christ died on the cross, but he didn't die because he committed some deeds worthy of death. Jesus died on the cross in our place. He died for your sin. And catch the weight of that. Jesus Christ offered himself as an atoning sacrifice for sin. He embraced death on the cross. And even more than that, he embraced the righteous judgment of his Father. So that, why? So that you could escape death. And that I can escape death. And judgment. And in that moment, he completely and eternally satisfied the righteous demands of God for our sins. I'm going to look at a couple passages. Look what it says in Romans. These are familiar passages, but Romans says, But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, some of you have been in church for your whole life. You've memorized this to the point that like, you could... You could dream it. But think about it for a moment. Let me, let me put this into a way that I think we, you guys would understand, and I think we all understand a little bit better. What if, what if we pr re replace ourselves in this? What if I said, but, you know, Pastor Pete showed his love for you, and that while you were attacking me, I sent my son to die for you. You would all think, man, that's no way on earth. That's exactly what God did for us. Then, but then Peter adds to that. He said, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree. He hung on that tree in the pain and the agony and his father turning his back on him. Why? So that we might die, as it says in this passage, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now we look at this and we see Paul is saying that Christ, the Son of God, this one who is God, died. Why? For us. But but fourthly, look, he says, the burial of the Savior. Look at verse 4. He says in verse 3 that Christ died for our sins, but then verse 4, that he was buried. You say, what's the significance of that? Well, what here is happening is Paul is affirming that Christ was buried following his sacrificial of death. The fact that Christ <laughs> was buried, what does it affirm? This is really tough. It affirms what? That he died. I mean... <laughs> That's kind of an obvious statement. But had Christ not been 
buried, then there would not have been a death. And had Christ not died, then sin would not have been atoned for, would not have been covered. And had sin not have been atoned for through the death of Jesus Christ, then we would still yet be in our sin and without any hope of rescue from the punishment that was coming our way. But he was buried. Look what it says in, in Mark. It says, and when he, that's Pilate, when Pilate learned from the centurion that he, that's Jesus, was dead, he, that's Pilate again, granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a, uh, a linen shroud and, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Imagine for a moment as we talked about that Christ was on the cross and he died and his body went limp. And they came up and probably not with a lot of care. They yanked him off the cross and his body fell to the ground. He was dead. And they took that body and they allowed this man Joseph to take it and they wrapped his body in this cloth, and, which was very traditional at that time. And they took it and they placed him in a borrowed tomb. And a stone, a massive stone was placed in front of him, probably weighing several tons. And then the Bible says that Pilate, not sure what that was going to take place, Pilate took guards and placed him in front of the tomb in order to watch and ensure that no one would come and steal the body. Now, first of all, I want to, I want to comment. That's kind, of, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? We just talked about he's God. He created all things as if you know, two guards and a stone was going to stop him. <laughs> But there's no doubt at this moment in, in history that Christ was dead. You know, there's skeptics today that are trying to disprove the resurrection of Christ. And they said, well, maybe he just passed out. It was pretty clear. He didn't just pass out. He was dead on the cross for our sins. And we come to the final thing here that, that Paul says in this particular part. He says that in verse 4 that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And finally here we come to the resurrection of the Savior. We come to the last and arguably most vital truth of the gospel and that is the resurrection. Jesus died on a cross to atone for our sin, and he was buried. However, here's the amazing part, we celebrate this at Easter, the grave could not hold him. After three days within the tomb, Jesus came forth in, in triumphant resurrection. And he proved that he could conquer sin, death, and hell. And by doing that, he gained victory for all who believe. I think it's impossible for us to overemphasize the importance of the resurrection. And granted, had Jesus not died, then there would have been no atonement for sin. But had he not risen again, the curse of death, the penalty of sin, would never have been broken. Had Christ not risen, he would have been like all other men who had gone before him. Here's the thing. Every religion that has ever existed had a leader. And every religion that has ever existed, their leader has died. And none of them have come back to life except for Jesus Christ. He's different. Because he had the ability to conquer death. Because he had the ability to rescue you from your sins. And the plan of redemption for humanity was was fulfilled as Christ rose triumphant from the grave. Because he lives, we have the promise of life beyond the grave, and we have the promise of eternal life with God. And you cannot embrace the gospel unless you embrace the resurrection. And if you deny the resurrection, then you deny the gospel. And without the resurrection, we are um, hopeless. Notice what it says if you have your Bibles in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at verse 17. Notice what it says there. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But he has. 
He has been raised. And that is the gospel. And that is what Paul is telling us here. Is that the gospel is that Jesus, who was Christ, died for you. And he was buried, but he rose again. The second aspect, not just the foundation. That's the foundation. If you, if you get what I just said, if you understand what I just said, then you're on, your, on the road ready to, to change, make life changes. But the second thing we want to notice is the redemptive truth of the gospel. Imagine for a moment you're at someone's house, a friend's house or something, and, and their phone rings and they pick it up, and immediately you can tell that they're receiving some kind of news. Now, you don't know what it is, but it doesn't take long to look on their face and realize it's bad news. You can tell that. A word doesn't need to be said, but you can see that, because bad news is something that we can see, just like good news is something that we can notice. The gospel is good news. In fact, it's glorious news. But wait, what makes this gospel good news is uh, even better than it already is, is the fact that it comes on the heels of bad news. In, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And you were dead in trespasses and sin. You see, before any of this happened that uh, we see take place here, every single person that has ever existed, and every single person that existed after that, was dead in their sins. That means they were hopeless. They had no opportunity for salvation. They had no opportunity for real life. You were dead. You ever received bad news? It's horrific. There's no worse news than here someone that you love has died. And what this passage is telling us is that because of your sin, you are dead. Now most of us don't get that news about ourselves. We do here. You know, you're not physically dead, you're spiritually dead. And because of your life without Christ, you are spiritually dead. And without hope. But the gospel says there's hope. Because of what God did, Jesus Christ did on the cross, the gospel is great news. And in the fact that not only is it what it gives us, but it, it just what it destroys. And that is this dead life. And it has taken care of three enemies. And I want to look at these in the next few moments. What are the three enemies? that are destroyed by the gospel. First of all, the final enemy of death. Look, if you will, at 1 Corinthians again, chapter 15. Look at verse 26. And it's listing here all the effects of the resurrection. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Over 100 years ago, um, well, typical in a lot of the towns and villages throughout our country, and even other countries in the world, was that when someone would die, when someone would pass away, the church in town, the local church, would ring their church bells to inform that someone had died. And the, many times what they would do is they would ring the bell the number of times of the years that the person lived. If the person lived to an old age, that would take a long time. But if a person, say a person was 20 years old, they would ring the bell 20 times person was eight. They'd ring it eight times. At this time, there was a young man by the name of Dwight L. Moody. Some of you have heard of him. And Dwight L. Moody said every time that someone would die, and he would hear the bell toll, and it would toll, and it would go one, two, and as it would go along, and get to 10, 11, 12, and get to 20, and it would, it would approach his age. He said that, that fear would grip him. Fear would grip him because it came to a realization that, that it would, if it would stop at his age, not that he died, but he would begin to think about what would it be if his soul died at this moment. And he lived in constant fear. And one day, someone came to D.L. Moody and told him about the gospel. And Moody received Christ as his Lord and Savior. And, and he said, after that, no more did I fear those bells. No more did I have to fear death at all. Because someone had given me the victory. And the good news is that Jesus has given us the victory. I heard a story about a boy who was outside and he was playing while his mother was uh, hanging the laundry on the line. 
I don't know if many do that anymore, but she was hanging out and suddenly a wasp came and landed on the, the little boy and, and stung him. He ran to his mom crying and, and told her what had happened and, and the mom stopped and just gently, as mothers do, said, it's all right, son. She looked at it and she said, look, I want to show you something. And she told him, she said, see, see how the bee left the stinger in your arm? That means he has no more ability to sting or hurt anyone ever again. You know, here's the reality. is because of what Jesus Christ did. If we follow him in faith, death has no more stinger for you. We see that actually in Corinthians. And I read this yesterday in Shirley, at Shirley Pachesny's funeral. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 55. I love what it says here, and, and, and he's, he says, Oh, death, where is your victory? There is no victory for death, because Jesus Christ has removed that. He says, Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is no power, there is no enemy of death. You know, one day, unless, unless Jesus Christ returns, I will physically die. But there will be no death. There will be no victory in that for death. Because the moment I die, the next moment I will be in the presence of Jesus Christ, my Savior. That's so powerful. So the gospel removes the uh, enemy of death. But secondly, the gospel removes the powerful enemy of sin. Before salvation, the heavy weight of sin weighed on our souls. But the gospel says all is forgiven. All of it. By love, Jesus stamped on my sin account, paid in full. Imagine, if you will, if all of us here were to have a list of every sin we've ever committed. It'd probably be a big file. When Jesus died on the cross, and when we by faith believe in what Jesus did on the cross, he takes out the, you know, the old stamp, and he hits the pad, and he hits on the thing, and it says, paid in full. And then what he does is this. He takes that file, and he puts it in the shredder. He says, it's gone. It's gone. See, in, in 1 John, John says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not just some sins, but all sin. It doesn't matter how big or how small. We were talking about that in our men's Sunday school class this morning. That sometimes we like to catalog our sins into different categories. It doesn't matter if it was a little, little white lie or some massive sin. That every single one of them is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't bring them up again. In the Old Testament... Uh, the prophet Micah talked about that, and he says, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread, out, tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. One of the songs we sang this morning talked about that, that the sea is, is not, there's no bottom to the sea when it talks about the idea that God casts our sins into the sea and they're gone. You know, sin has no hold on the believer. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy of sin anymore. We live in righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the second enemy, the enemy of, of sin, has been blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. But thirdly, we don't look at the powerful enemy of judgment. No one ever wants to face judgment. We don't want that. We want to be free from that. Way back when you were a, a little child and your, your parents called your name and you realized, uh-oh. They didn't say that because of that I did something good. They said that because I'm in trouble. And as you're marching to your parents, you're thinking, what excuses can I make to get out of whatever I did? I don't know what it is yet, but I'm in trouble. We don't want judgment. And our sin places us in the path of judgment. Our sin puts us ready there, and it's just come in full force. And there's nothing we can do about it. But the gospel gives us hope. That's why in Romans it says this, There is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. 
Isn't that an amazing thought? None. We condemn ourselves more than Jesus ever did with us. We condemn others more than Jesus ever did with us. Because when we come to a point where we place our faith in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus Christ, then what Jesus does is he stands between us and, and the, the, the judgment that's headed our way. And he says to God, I did it already. What, a, what an incredible good news that is to me. Many, many years ago, in uh, the early days of our country, back when you know the West was the Wild West, and it was opening up for people, and, and cowboys would drive their cattle across the prairie. It was said that there was a time when wildfires happened all the time. And these wildfires would start across the prairie, and they would go so fast, that they would, and, and because it wasn't the same as today, that they would just burn tons and tons and tons of acres before they could even stop it. And oftentimes, in the midst of those massive wildfires, that cowboys would get caught in the midst of these fires, and they would be burned. One cowboy relayed in his diary about a time during a terrible prairie fire as, as he was riding along in his horse and the fire was coming so fast that it was actually faster than his horse. It was just, it was just coming and catching up to him. And he thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know the escape. There was no water in sight. He didn't know what to do. And so he thought of an idea and he rode as far as he could ahead and he got ahead of the fire and he got out and he took a match and he reached down and he started a fire say, why did he do that? And then he got behind the fire, and, and the fire was there. And what happened was, is he watched as this massive prairie fire came along and hit the fire he started, and it couldn't go any further. Why? Because it had already had burnt out. And he was in a zone that was already burnt. And later, when he was telling his story, he says this, I was saved from the fire because I stood in a place that had already been burned. Here's the thing, as us as believers, I too stand in a place where judgment has already been completed. I stand in the shadow of the cross. And that is, for us, the gospel is that I stand, and, and every time I sin, and every time I feel this guilt because of my sin, and I think, God, don't judge me, Jesus says, look, you, you're already in my shadow. I've already, I've already covered it. And yet so often we live with that impending doom of judgment coming our way. And Jesus said, I, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we see the incredible nature, the redemptive truth of the gospel. But thirdly, we see the sovereign truth of the gospel. And I want you to know this. This is just a quick point, but I want you to look at this. Look back at our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at th verses 3 and 4. There's two phrases that I skipped. Uh, look, if you will, at the middle of verse 3, it says, For that Christ died for our sins. What does it say? Say it to me. Thank you. You guys need to wake up. That's why I was doing that. Okay. And then it says in verse 4 that he was buried and that he ra it was raised on the third day. A little better, but still pretty weak. Okay, But he says, in accordance with the scriptures, we must understand that the events involved in the gospel, the events involved around Jesus Christ's death were no accident. Jesus did not die because religious leaders among the Jews and the powers that be consented and came together to predict or to bring about his death. He died according to the providential plan of God. Isn't that incredible? Jesus came to earth with a sole purpose, and that purpose was to die for our sin and to rise again for our justification. And while it completely saddens me to consider all that Jesus endured on the cross, on my behalf, I rejoice in the cross of Christ. He willingly submitted himself to the plan of redemption to save us from sin and to reconcile us to God. And the prophecies throughout the Old Testament were fulfilled through the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
The sovereign truth of the gospel is it just didn't happen when Jesus died. It's something that had been orchestrated long before. God knew what he was doing. And then finally, in the next few moments, the transforming truth of the gospel. It said at the beginning, I skipped the beginning phrase for a reason. Look at verse 3 again. For I delivered to you uh, as of first importance what I received. This, this statement reveals a transforming truth of the gospel. And we're going to develop this more as we go throughout this year. But the transforming truth of the gospel is it shouldn't, make you, it shouldn't cause you to stay at the same spot. We see two aspects of this. First of all, Paul received the gospel. We're going to see that Paul shared, but Paul could only share what he had received. See, Paul had, was publicly confessing his belief in the gospel and revealing that he had personally received it by faith. He was identifying with what he was about to talk about. He's identifying that Jesus Christ was his Lord. He was identifying that Jesus Christ had died for his sins, and he knew all that. He was identifying the risen Savior. See, once presented to us and once understood, the gospel always demands a response. Always. And if you're here this morning, the gospel demands that you respond. Because if you're here this morning, every single person in this room, without exception, has sinned against the holy God. And so therefore, that, that flood of judgment is coming heavy at you. And you haven't received it yet, but you will. And your only escape is by faith to escape behind the shadow of the cross. And that demands that you respond. See, but it's such a personal response. I cannot receive the gospel for you. My salvation is non-transferable. It's me and me alone. As I received Christ by faith, my life was completely and eternally transformed. And the old man of sin died, and I was resurrected, as the Bible says, now I am a new creature. Old things are passed away. And one cannot receive the gospel and remain as they were. The gospel always brings a transformation, always brings a change, and it should continually bring a change. And it's not just enough to say, yes, I believe, but it should change. I've said this before, the Bible tells us that even the demons believe. But really, truly understanding the gospel and accepting the gift of salvation is going to bring transformation because Paul received it. And so because of that, he was changed. But not only that, one of those changes that occurred was Paul shared what he had received. Notice again, it says in this passage, for I delivered to you. See, why did Paul deliver? Because he first received. Now, when you receive good news, you don't want to hold it back. I talked about that good news we received at the beginning, at the beginning of the service of a big gift that was given to our church. Do you know I didn't just go, oh, that's nice, and not tell a soul. Now, I had a problem because the person wanted me to keep it anonymous. But I sure was willing to tell people what God had done. Because it's amazing news. But even greater than giving, getting money is our salvation. And having received salvation, Paul was compelled to share it with others. He did not keep the good news of the gospel to himself. He delivered the message of the gospel to anyone who would hear it. And Paul, throughout his life, after he received Christ, faithfully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. And that is the responsibility God has given to each of you. And that was the thrust of my message last week. That as believers, being transformed by the power of God, we now have an obligation not, not something we can do if we feel like it. We have an obligation to proclaim the good news to those who have not yet received it. This is not optional. This is not something if you feel you're gifted enough. It is expected of everyone who has received salvation. We looked at the passage last week in Matthew Go and make disciples. That command, go, is an imperative command. It is a command that is, uh, it, it has a necessity to it. It wasn't like those, hey, if you feel like it, do it. We must be willing to share the good news with Christ. Now this morning, you have heard 
a clear presentation of the gospel. And that's not, I, I don't give that every single week, but this morning you have definitely heard a clear presentation of the gospel. But here is the thing, you are now responsible to do something about what you've heard. If you are unsaved, if you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross, then respond in repentance and faith and you will receive salvation. If you have never done that, whether you've been in this church many times or whether this is your first time in this church, it, it, you can be at a point where you realize, you know, I've never done that. I've never placed my faith. I've tried to rely on my own good work. So I've tried to rely on all these other things and nothing is going to remove you from the flood of God's judgment that's heading your way except for Jesus standing in the way. In His blood. But if you are saved, I pray the gospel will be the central aspect, central theme in your life. And that you will share it with others. As I said, this is a series we're going to go into. We're going to expand on this over the coming, really, months. We're going to expand on the meaning of the gospel in the next four weeks. What are we talking about more specifically? And then after that, we're going to look how the gospel should affect us. Because here's the thing, as I said, if you really believe the gospel, it is going to affect you in so many, in every way. It's going to affect the way that you interact with others. It's going to affect your view of forgiveness. It's going to affect your, your view of your standards before God. It's going to affect the way, the way you view the Bible. It's going to affect so many different ways. It's going to affect the way that you uh, are as a mother, the way that you are as a father, the way you are as a kid. <coughs> it's going to affect you if you really believe it. Here's my question for you. How are you going to respond to the gospel today? Let's pray. God, I thank you for the privilege that I have of sharing the good news with those here this morning. Or many in this room have heard this before. This is not new news to them, but yet sometimes we uh, allow it to become old and dated news when the reality is this is the best news that we can ever receive. And God, I'm, I'm aware that there is likely, well, it's almost a guarantee that there is someone in this room who is still standing in the path of your judgment to come. They're, they're sinful. Lord, maybe they're trying to do good things. Maybe they think if they're here at church, or maybe they think if they read their Bible or these other things, that somehow that's going to protect them from from your wrath, but we know your word tells us that it won't. Nothing that we do, that's why your word says that it's not by works of righteousness that we do, but it is because of what Jesus Christ did. And Lord, I pray that whoever here this morning has never, ever placed their faith in you, they have never turned from their own sinful ways, that they will trust in you today. And that they will accept this good news. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them. God, I can't do it. It has to be your Holy Spirit driving them to an understanding of who you are and what you have done. God, I pray for those who have accepted that gift of salvation. I pray that you will help them to understand that they still have to respond daily to the gospel. That it has power to transform their life and should. Lord, that this good news that you have given us should not be kept to ourselves. In fact, if we keep it to ourselves, we are disobeying you. So Lord, I pray that you will help us to allow the gospel to change us. Thank you again. I'm going to ask just for a moment that everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. And again, this is not something I do every week, but I want to ask. If there's any here this morning that would say, um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever truly placed my faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross for my salvation. If that's you, I'm the only one looking. 
if you would just slip up your hand so I can pray for you. Okay. I'm going to ask as Christians, is there anyone that would say, you know what? I am not allowing the gospel to transform me in the way it should. And I'm asking God that he will begin to transform my life through the gospel. If that's you, would you just slip up? Let's pray again. God, we thank you for these people, and I pray that you work in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor. Please stand with me as we sing together more love to thee. Our community, 
something that heals. Uh, we have hearts, Father, that need to be broken and, and, and made new. And so I pray that your gospel would do that this year. Help us as a church to be a lighthouse in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.